All right. Hello, everybody. It's Tracy Prachi with the RCAW, and I'm here with Trent Cotney from Cotney Attorneys and Consultants. And he's here to talk to us today about OSHA and anything else. Um, we're looking forward to having Trent. He's always a wealth of information and has been so helpful with so much stuff through COVID for all of us. Um, I'm going to encourage you, if you have questions, to type them in the chat box. And when we get to the end, we'll answer all your questions. And this is also being recorded. So anytime that you need to refer back to it, you can. Um, you can just get over to our YouTube channel. So with that, I'm going to hop off and I'm going to let Trent go forward. All right. Well, thank you so much, Tracy. I always enjoy being able to speak to you guys. And I'm going to share my screen here and get the PowerPoint started. So I wanted to do something uh, special for you guys today. And um, we're going to talk a little bit about some updates, especially as it relates to COVID-19. But really what I wanted to do is I wanted to spend some time helping you understand how to prepare for an inspection, okay? Because a lot of times we get called in after the inspections occurred and after the complaint or, you know, federally after the citation has been issued, um, and we work a lot of magic, that's what we do, but at the end of the day, the, the homework happens during the inspection process. So what I want to do is I want to impart some real world help for you, right? Uh, I've always been a big believer in being proactive rather than reactive, and I think if I can, you know, my goal in today's webinar is to have you take home one, two, maybe three points that will help you avoid getting into trouble, okay? So what I wanna do is go ahead and start off and I do wanna talk a little bit about some of the updates that have happened in Washington. And Washington, like um, you know, Oregon and California and several other states has been very active with its legislation, okay? We, we, uh, I had my team put together a chronology of all the changes that involve COVID-19 and it's two pages long. <laughs> So, you know, that's a very difficult situation for any contractor to be in. And many of you, um, you know, you may cross borders from one county to the next. You may cross over to Oregon, right? Or you may be doing work up north in Canada, you know, and the rules change everywhere. So this has been a very difficult time for contractors to kind of figure out what they're supposed to do and what not to do. And one of the things that we've seen, especially in the last, I'd say, four or five months, is a big uptick in Washington related safety citations or complaints related to failure to comply with COVID-19 guidelines. Um, a lot of this arose out of the fact that OSHA was not overly active um, at the beginning of COVID in creating its own federal guidelines. It punted to the CDC and it did have a couple of um, you know, PDFs that they put out for purposes of saying, here's what to do, but no real rulemaking. So Washington State, you know, Wishel and I, they really took a proactive approach um, to trying to regulate COVID-19. And in some cases, it may be too much. You know, others may say it's not enough, uh, but it is what it is. So what I wanted to do is just kind of run through those updates with you real you know, briefly, kind of go through those with you. And then uh, turn to sort of the self-help that I think will really, it, that's the key thing here. That This is where I see most roofing contractors miss the mark, okay? Um, before we get started, there's a couple of things that I, I want to talk to you guys about. The first is, is I know more about safety than your average bear, but I am not a safety consultant, okay? I'm looking at things from a legal standpoint. Right, I've got an OSHA 10, an OSHA 30, the Haswell for 24. I got training, but I am not a safety consultant. I am a liability consultant. So there is a difference, right? The difference is, is that oftentimes your safety director is solely focused on safety, which they should be, right? That is their responsibility. I am focused on safety. You know, I believe that every penny spent on safety is a penny well spent. But I've also got that lawyer hat on. As much as I would like not to have it on, it's part of me. It's ingrained in me, and I'm always thinking about liability and how to put your best foot forward. So that's the first thing I want to tell you. The second thing I want to tell you is, regardless of what happens during an investigation or you know the complaint process, always tell the truth, always cooperate. Okay. And the reason I tell you that is we have been involved in defending roofing contractors when that has not happened. Okay. 
and it could potentially be a very bad situation. And I'll give you an example. On a federal level, if you are in a state that has a federal OSHA, which is 24, uh, 24 states that are out there, Washington is not one of them, uh, and you fail to tender over documents and you knowingly hide something, that could be obstruction of justice, okay? Remember, they are federal agents, so I don't need to tell you what bad stuff can happen to you if you don't comply, okay? So that's the first thing. It doesn't matter, you know, if, it's like my dad said, it, if you're, it doesn't matter if your children are ugly or not, you got to put them out there, right? Same kind of thing. Uh, just make sure that you're always telling the truth and, um, but know your rights. That's the key thing. So, Let's go over these COVID-related uh, updates. And what they did is I said, look, you, you got to have the following things in place. And we're going to break these down for you, okay? The first is you got to develop a COVID-19 exposure control and mitigation recovery plan, okay? you got to make sure that you've got this in writing and that you can disseminate it to your crew and other people in your office. You've got to appoint a COVID-19 supervisor for each work site. Normally what I see, that's the crew leader or the foreman or the superintendent whoever's in charge of that job. You've got to conduct a COVID-19 employee training, which consists of toolbox talks. We'll talk about that. Obviously, you always want to ensure social distancing. This is one of the things that has been very difficult from a practical standpoint, okay? We've all got crew cabs, right? And I, I know you know, having worked in construction myself a little bit before um, becoming, you know, turned to the dark side, becoming a lawyer, I, um, I know that you try to fit as many people into a crew cab as possible. And it's difficult to socially distance in that, that kind of situation. So um, we'll talk a little bit more about how to deal with that, what you can do and what you can't do. Um, but obviously ensuring that is important. You want to provide PPE, okay? And this is not your standard PPE that you would normally provide for construction projects. This may be enhanced PPE depending on the nature of the project that you are performing. So it could be providing your N95s, K95s, you know, respirators, whatever might be needed depending on the gravity of um, the type of project that you're working on. So if you are working, if you're doing remediation of COVID-19 in a nursing home, you need to be in a damn biohazard suit, right? And I'm just giving that as an example, but you know what I mean, right? The idea is that if the uh, more likely you are to be exposed to COVID-19, the higher the safety protocols need to be. There is an interesting um, uh, set of guidelines that OSHA put out early on. And if you go to their website, OSHA.gov, they kind of go through a lot of the different protocols for construction sites. I know uh, WISHA also put out something very similarly where they said, look, these are some elevated areas that you need to watch out for. So if you go to LNI's website or any of the corresponding websites, they will give you great examples of that. The other thing is sanitation and cleanliness. One of the things I've advocated throughout COVID-19 is to have a job site protection plan. You know, make sure that you have someone that is engaged in cleaning common surfaces and Nobody likes lawyers, right? Myself included, except for the people that work here. Um, but this is a way where legal and safety can actually help you sell jobs. And that's when people's ears perk up. They say, what? The lawyer talked about selling jobs. Well, here's how you do it is, you know, you, you put a, a job site checklist on a job box or somewhere out where the customer can see it. I'm using an example if it's a residential project, or let's say it's a commercial where you've got a a owner that is active on the job site. If you have a checklist and you have some guy going by or gal going by every hour checking that you know common areas were clean, the ladders were clean, this, that, and the other, and they sign off on it, then that gives everybody on that job site some reassurance and it also gives the customer some reassurance. That can be part of your job site protection plan. And you can use that as a selling tool. You can say, look, we're not like these other people. We take this seriously. You know, this is what we're gonna do to make sure that you can see safe and sound and that your tenants are okay or your customers are okay, whatever it might be. And it, it works. So that's something to keep in mind. The other thing that you want to do is obviously monitor employee health and symptoms. You know, this includes asking the COVID-19 related questions. Uh, I had to go into the dentist yesterday, which is never a fun thing. It's like seeing your lawyer, except for worse. Um, and I had to basically sign my life away and, you know, attest that I didn't have a fever and everything else. Um, that's become common practice now. Okay. Uh, and then one of the things that you want to do is make sure that you are avoiding retaliation or discrimination. This is key because a lot of times um, you could end up in a situation where 
uh, someone decides that they are concerned about COVID-19 and you brush it aside, okay? And it's not necessarily a political issue. It is on the outside, but as an employer, you have to put politics aside. It doesn't matter if you think it's a hoax or you think it's the worst thing ever. At the end of the day, there's liability, right? And I told you at the onset, that's what I think about. I live and dream liability. I'm always looking, you know, how, how could someone get sued? This is how you can get sued. So even if you think it is the dumbest thing ever, you have to take it seriously for the purposes of your employees because they can sue you for retaliation in the event that you terminate them or take adverse action uh, if they requested certain safety protocols. So that's an issue that you need to spot. And if it happens, just remember, hey, Trent said something about this and then do more digging on it, okay? So next thing I wanna to talk to you about is I wanna go into detail on each of these, okay? We talked about developing a mitigation recovery plan, okay? This, and I'm not gonna read the whole thing to you, but it talks about what the plan has to include. Now, many of you may have seen me speak before. I've had the pleasure of speaking to, to uh, our call before. And um, one of the things I always say is the party with the best paper wins the day. So if it is good for you, you put it in writing. And if it's bad for you, you pick up the phone. This is a great example of putting this in writing, okay? It's very easy to put this plan in place. One of the ways that I have seen Washington roofing contractors, um, you know, uh, get cited or have a complaint issued for COVID-19 related issues is uh, failure to train. So if you have the capability of putting this in writing and then getting it out to your employees, having them sign off on it, that is part of the process, okay? So you need all of these elements on there. We talked about some of them, you know, incident reporting is critical, uh, exposure response, how you deal with it. How do you quarantine? All these types of things. This is a great example of how HR, legal, and safety become one, okay? Because there are elements of each as it relates to this. And then here's the key thing is you've got to have, you got to have the stick, right? If somebody doesn't follow what they're supposed to be doing, you got to have a way to, you know, uh, notify them of the violation, right? There has to be an enforcement policy. You can't just have something posted in your kitchen saying this is what you're supposed to do, but then you turn a blind eye when everybody's at happy hour, you know, inside your office. So, and that's happened before. I had a roofing contractor call me, uh, where was it? It was out of Wyoming. And uh, they used to, you know, kick back at, you know, three o'clock on Fridays, crack open a bunch of beers, talk about the week, right? Sounds like a fun time to me, but the problem is, is it doesn't, it's not kosher with COVID-19. So that's something that you want to think about, okay? There's also some other issues there, but that's a different uh, different webinar. Um, you want to appoint a COVID-19 supervisor, okay? Just to kind of cut through this, easiest thing to do is make your crew leader or somebody that knows how to run that job um, your, your COVID-19 supervisor. But they need to understand what that means and the importance of that, okay? They need to understand what they have to do, how they have to do it. They can't, you can't just say, hey, you know, John, you're a, you're a, a COVID-19 supervisor, they add it to their LinkedIn profile and they don't do anything with it, okay? They have to actually know what that means, right? You wanna be able to conduct COVID-19 employee training. And what's important about this is making sure that you provide training in a way that makes sense, okay? And I'll give you some great examples. Like right now I'm talking to you in, in one of our training rooms, right? And uh, pre-COVID, I would have a lot of my lawyers come in and I would talk to them about a variety of things, right? And just like your crew, they rarely listen to me. Um, so what I started doing was I tried to make it more interactive. Instead of me talking for an hour or two hours, whatever the time was, I would make them talk, right? And a great example is I've, I've got a meeting coming up. Uh, I'm not gonna talk at all. I'm making everybody else talk. It makes my life easier. And uh, secretly, I enjoy inflicting punishment. So that's, that's a great thing for me and make them speak. The idea behind that, though, is you want your people uh, vested in what you're talking about, right? And I've always found where you make your crew step up and actually give some of the safety training with oversight to make sure they're doing the right stuff, that others pay more attention because they want to see if the guy or gal is going to screw up. Uh, but it also, um, you know, enforces that safety better so they remember it. So this is a great example of COVID-19, how you can kind of, you know, just rather than saying, here are the rules and you read them, figure out some way to make it a little bit more interactive. 
Um, again, if you're engaging in this, you don't want to violate COVID-19 while you're providing COVID-19 employee training. So we have switched to a lot of virtual training. Uh, we have a training center, workforce training center here at our office, and we've done all virtual with the exception of uh, a couple of different times that we had NRCA down. Um, and even then we spaced properly, had masks on, everything that we needed to do. So there are ways now to easily do safety training virtually. There are a lot of apps out there. Uh, just look how we're communicating now. This has become common. You know, I, I don't do phone conferences anymore. They're all over Zoom, right? So uh, the days of me, you know, dressing down are over. I'm always have to be semi-prepared. So um, the key thing is, is if somebody attends this training, you've got to have sign-off sheets, okay? If it's not in writing, it doesn't count. And, you know, that's, I've seen this over and over and over again. I've got an employer telling me, hey, I've trained this person, they know this, and then the employee is telling OSHA or WISHA or whatever, you know, any of the um, uh, state plans that they've never been trained before. So this is an issue that, that uh, I really want to hit home, and that is make sure that you get sign-off sheets on this COVID-19 training, okay? Put them in the employee files, put them in your safety files. That way, that if you know that that person violated one, then you may potentially have an unpreventable employee misconduct defense, which we'll talk about, right? That's one of the key defenses to defending against one of these types of complaints, okay? Let's talk about ensuring social distancing. It sounds easy, but it's not easy. They said, okay, it's six feet. Now they say it's, you know, in school it can be three feet. You know, they keep changing the rules, but... For all intents and purposes, if you stick to six, you should be good. Um, the last point is one that I kind of want to hit home. Uh, in instances where the six feet can't be done, then you've got to do a job hazard analysis just like you would do on any job, and you've got to figure out ways to mitigate the risk, okay? And in doing that analysis, that's a great example of something that you want to have in writing, okay? For those of you that do commercial work, okay, you may have to do daily reports. And daily reports are one of the easiest ways that you as roofing contractors can put in a bunch of self-serving statements that will help you, okay? A lot of times on daily reports, I see stuff like, you know, went to the job, uh, we started at this time, we ended at this time, we, you know, did the tear off today on, you know, on whatever, okay? That's great, but that didn't help you. It would be so much better if you said, hey, got to the job site at this time. We did a safety audit where we inspected everything. We made sure that social distancing was being applied. Everyone had their PPE and mask. We talked about potential COVID-19 risk. You know, all that self-serving stuff so that in the event that you get inspected, you have the ability to show a document that was contemporaneous at the time that you were doing it, right? Decent. That's decent. It's not, is it a slam dunk? No, but it helps, okay? Every piece of documentation helps. That's what I want you thinking about. Right? I want you thinking about this because that's what's going to help you. Okay? We all want our employees to go home safe every single night. That's never a question. The idea is, is that you want to make it a fair uh, game. Right? It's got to be an even playing field. And in order to do that, you've got to put your best foot forward. How do you do that? Paper, 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 paper. And obviously, it's electronic now, but you know what I'm saying. So... The next thing is, is that you want to provide PPE, and we already talked about this. One of the key things to watch out here, though, and, and I've seen, um, I was talking, we've got an active matter um, in Washington right now on a, uh, it's not a COVID violation, but it is a fall protection related violation that involves PPE. And I've been talking to my um, safety consultant that we've retained for purposes of expert testimony out there. One of the issues that, uh, that, I faced in dealing with this was that PPE was being lent, meaning uh, this person did not have their own PPE. The employer didn't provide it, but one of the employees did, and it was defective. Okay, so you want to be very careful in terms of COVID-19 in lending PPE equipment. Okay, you want to either, you know, sanitize it or make sure people are using the same PPE that they always use give them their own PPE, whatever it might be. Uh, the key here is that's something that they're going to check, okay? So you definitely wanna, wanna make sure that, that uh, you're on top of that for purposes of kind of figuring out um, where the exposure points are. This is something that we've seen inspectors ask, okay? 
Um, we had one recently, uh, it was right on the border of uh, Washington and Oregon. Uh, our lawyer went uh, to the job site and noticed that all the PPE was being stored in the back of a truck and the crew members would just take it and put it on, okay? And that's, that's normal. Look, I, I get it, it's construction, don't yell at me, I get it, that's normal. Okay, but the reality is, is if an inspector comes out and sees that, then that may create a potential, you know, COVID-19 risk because there's shared equipment that's not being properly sanitized. So the key there is you want to make sure that you've got a plan in place to kind of deal with this in the event that you're asked or in the event that you're inspected. So hopefully that makes sense. Okay, sanitation and cleanliness. Now what this means is, look, if you see a pile of rubble, you're not going to spray Lysol on it. That's not what I'm talking about. It's making sure that you've got, you know, hand washing stations, you've got your sanitizer. Um, you know, I don't know how many metric tons of sanitizer we have here in this office, but I can show you the receipts. It's a lot, okay? Uh, disposable gloves, um, you know, if you're going to be transmitting tools. And again, I know you're rolling your eyes at this point to a certain extent. Uh, I get it, but these are the rules, okay? You need to make sure that if you are you know, uh, I've got equipment that is commonly used that you're sanitizing at the beginning of the day and at least at the end of the day. Um, sanitize your crew cabs. Uh, try to limit access so that you put one in each corner to the extent that you can. Have more mask. Um, you know, they can potentially drive their own trucks. You might have some wage and hour issues there. Um, have a schedule in place that dictates how you're going to go about cleaning, right? You want to make sure that any commonly, like I've, I've said, that checklist it creates accountability. It also reassures your customer. So that's a great way to make sure that your customer knows that you care about COVID-19. Again, don't care about the politics. This is about liability, okay? Um, other than that, the only other thing I would mention on this, one of the things that over the summer, um, I saw some things pop up, uh, definitely in, in Washington and then in California as well. Uh, we had um, a lot of hydration related issues. Um, I was getting a ton of phone calls with crew members having to go to the hospital um, and it was around the summer, okay? Now, the issue, what was unusual about it is we normally expect that during summer to a certain extent, but this was roughly 10, 15 times what we normally see. And what we after doing some digging and talking to our, our OSHA team, uh, what we found was a lot of this, um, you know, heat injury and illness related injuries were a result of mask wearing and not having the community water jug available anymore. Some contractors took the opposite approach to this and said, look, we're not going to get tagged for having, you know, not having proper water on the job site. We're just going to remove it. And the contractors with their mask on, sometimes they didn't have proper breathable mask on, it would create more ambient heat. And we had a lot of heat injury and illness as a result. So one of the things that I want to encourage is make sure that, you know, even in cool temperatures, it's very easy to get dehydrated. We see it all the time. Okay. And it sneaks up on you when it's cool. Um, so you want to make sure that you have, you know, water on the job site, you're taking water breaks, you're documenting water breaks. Um, again, you know, especially when it gets warmer, but definitely something to watch out for with these heightened PPE requirements. It sneaks up on you. It's not something I really realized until we saw that happen. And I remember when it happened, it was probably the first, second week of June when we started getting all those phone calls. So as we start to heat up again, recognize that it may become an issue. You want to monitor employee health and symptoms, okay? Uh, employers should create policies that say, look, if you're sick, you got to stay home. The days of coming in sick, you know, are over. Um, I remember, you know, I would basically be, I, I would have to have an arm missing or something for me to miss work. I, 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 I'm one of those people that I'm, regardless of what's going on, I'm coming in. Uh, I'll shut the door. I'd stay away from you. That's over, right? And I think that might be a good thing. So um, that is kind of where we're at now. If someone's sick, they got to stay home. Um, always take the precautions, make sure that you're working with your HR staff about proper communication. One of the things where we've seen a lot of screw-ups on is confidentiality, okay? So let's say, for example, your person at the front desk, um, let's say, you know, he or she 
gets COVID-19, you know about it because you're management and they, they get sent home, okay? And you've got to provide who they were close to, right? You've got to notify those people that they were exposed to COVID-19. Well, to the extent that you can, you got to keep that person's identity a secret, okay? I know it's impossible. You know, classic example is you got a four, four person crew out on a roof, you know, doing residential roofing and one's missing, everybody's going to know who it is. But that's a safe thing to do because if you don't, you could potentially end up with some kind of ADA uh, violation for um, privacy type stuff. So be very careful about that. Try not to call out people that have been exposed to COVID-19. Remember, you can do thermometer checks, no touch are the best. Um, you know, we were using our FLIRs for a while, um, you know, the infrared guns, but uh, we got real ones after after about a month or so. So that's a good way to, uh, to do the checks, um, you know, avoid touch points at all costs. On vaccines, now this is, is interesting. And as I understand it, construction's coming up here quick. Um, so you guys should be good to go if that's your choice. Um, vaccine plans for the construction industry, uh, they've got phase by phase approach. Is it mandatory? No, it's your choice. You can get it. It's up to you as to whether or not to decide whether or not you want it. Uh, we've had a lot of questions about, do I tell my employees they have to get it? I don't recommend that, okay, because uh, you could potentially face some federal related issues. Uh, if you've got someone that is, for religious reasons, doesn't believe in vaccines, that could be a Title VII discrimination type issue. You may have somebody that has allergic reactions to vaccines. That may be an ADA related issue. Either one of them require a reasonable accommodation and it could potentially get you in trouble. So I prefer doing vaccines, voluntary vaccination program with an incentive. You know, we're gonna offer gift cards here uh, or something like that uh, for people that wanna get them um, or don't do anything at all, okay? Uh, but where this comes into play a lot is we see a lot of issues where your customers are gonna start requiring that you show proof of vaccination before you get on a job site, okay? Can they do that? Yes, absolutely they can do that. The question is, is at what point do they do that? Okay, if you've got an existing contract and there's nothing in that contract about it and they say, from now on, everybody has to be vaccinated because you're a construction worker and you're eligible for vaccinations, they can't add that into the mix unless there is a local, state, or federal requirement that requires that, okay? You can ask for additional consideration for it, but they can't enforce it. It's not a material uh, term of the contract. But let's say, let me give you a different example. Let's say you are bidding a job. Okay, you're getting ready to bid a job, and as part of that job, it says all workers will be vaccinated, and you bid that job. Well, guess what? You better have a crew that's vaccinated, and you better have a couple of alternatives in case you end up losing a couple of those people. So um, that's kind of where we are with vaccines. Uh, some other questions that I tried to answer here, completed the vaccine series. You know, some of the vaccines have two shots, some have one shot. If I'm exposed, do I still need to quarantine? No, you don't have to quarantine. But what's interesting is that a lot of the things that you still do, you do before the vaccine, you still have to do after the vaccine. So you still want to watch your symptoms. You know, uh, we'll talk about here some more. If vaccinated, do you still have to wear a mask? Okay, there's no 100% official guidelines from a state perspective, but from a CDC perspective, yeah, you still wear masks. You still do everything that you would normally do. You still follow the CDC and health department travel restrictions. Now, we have, we have seen some additional guidance that may be coming out specifically as it relates to construction workers wearing masks as opposed to normal PPE that you would expect. But right now, my advice is yes, yeah, still comply with whatever you gotta comply with. Uh, it'll make your life easier for now. Uh, recognize that you, know, you can laugh behind the mask, but that's kind of what we're recommending at this point. So I'm gonna check the chat real quick. Uh, so thoughts on scheduling an on-site company event to offer voluntary vaccines company-wide. So the question was, is, is what are my thoughts on scheduling an on-site company event to offer va voluntary vaccines? What I would recommend that you do is work through your third-party benefit provider, okay? And the reason I say that is they're going to know how to cross the T's and dot the I's. There are some things that could potentially get you in trouble, okay? Um, People have reported side effects. We've had several people here in the office that have had to take time off because they've had fever-like conditions after getting either the first or the second shot. If you vaccinate your entire workforce on the same day, 
you can expect some additional PTO or some additional time off. It may impact something. You know, I'm going to try to schedule mine on a weekend if I can. If I can, I'll get it whenever I can. But um, you want to work with your third-party benefits provider because they're going to be able to thread that needle and make sure that it's done. It's not you doing it. It's someone else coming in doing it. It's the same thing that I would recommend if you're doing drone work. You know, I like to have a drone that uh, I like to, to have another party or another company um, do all the drone footage. And that way, if you crash a drone into a building, it's the other company's liability. Even if it's your own company, it's just a separate entity that you've created. The same thing I would do here is I would work with the benefits provider to see if they can help provide it rather than you saying, okay, it, this is, we're doing this, this is how we're doing it, that kind of thing. Um, one other thing on that, uh, I don't think there's anything necessarily wrong with doing a company-wide event. We've done that in the past for flu shots. Uh, I would just really recommend, again, work with your HR, work with your benefits. You should be fine, but there are various things that you got to consider. I had one more question here. Um, same question. Okay. So uh, back to the story here. What I want to do now is uh, talk a little bit about the statewide face covering. Again, this has been a moving target. I'll be honest with you. You know, we're, are, we, it's, it's amazing how many times COVID-19 rules have changed in Washington and surrounding areas. Um, this is, is current, uh, and I put the date here. <laughs> So while we're talking, they may have changed it. Um, recognize, I always defer to, you know, LNI and any of the, the local safety uh, websites as far as figuring out what the guidelines are. But I wanted to provide you with what we know so far. So these are the general requirements. Uh, I believe uh, Tracy also sent these out via email. I'm not going to read them again, but I wanted to, ha wanted to make sure you had them uh, for purposes of this uh, webinar. What's the penalty? Well, right now, this is what the penalty looks like. Okay, you can actually get fined. We have dealt with fines, okay? And we haven't just dealt with fines. We've dealt with it on the employer side of things through uh, WISHA and DOSH type um, actions and complaints. So recognize that there is some liability. There are a lot of people that, uh, that we know have gotten fined, primarily as a result of people that ratted them out. <laughs> So uh, this is something that you want to watch out for because it is a real thing. It does happen. So now what I want to do is I want to turn to, uh, this is what I call the good stuff, okay? Not that the other stuff wasn't good, but this is what I want to do now is I want to spend the next 30 minutes imparting my real world knowledge to you. Now we do OSHA defense all over the U.S. You know, um, as of Monday, we had active uh, OSHA uh, citations or complaints we are defending in 29 states. So we have a lot of wealth of knowledge and we understand the tactics and techniques that are used to kind of prosecute these claims. Again, let me reiterate, always tell the truth, always cooperate, know your rights, okay? To me, everything that you do from a safety perspective is money well spent. And we're gonna talk about that in a little bit more detail. So. First question I often get is, why should I care? And the, the obvious reason is whether you're preparing for OSHA or Washington OSHA, the issue is employee safety, right? And it doesn't matter whether it's your best producer or that person you just hired. We're human beings. We want our people to go home safe. We don't want people to get hurt, okay? That's not why we're in business, right? Um, that's pretty obvious. Well, if that's not enough of a reason to really care and to change things, then you should understand that Washington aggressively enforces safety, okay? And the uh, one thing that we've seen is, is a lot of the fines that are issued can be steep, very steep. They are uh, adjusted for inflation. They have increased over the years, and there there is a wide variety of um, uh, severity penalties that can be assessed under the Washington Administrative Code uh, that dictate, you know, how much your fine is going to be. Now, the other thing, obviously, is that if you are aware of what the safety regulations are, it helps promote job safety. It reduces injuries, which, include, which in turn can reduce your insurance premiums, right? So that's another thing is, you know, um, 
Unfortunately, I have had to defend a lot of roofing contractors and fatalities and serious injuries. And they're, my job is to always stay calm, cool, and collected, right? That's what I have to do. That's what I get paid for. But I got to tell you, there's a lot of moving parts when something like that happens. You've got to deal with the press. You got to deal with insurance. You got to deal with the, the sheriff's office, highway patrol, uh, the customer, uh, bad guy lawyers, competitors, you name it. Everybody's coming after you, right? So one of the things that you want to be concerned about is that if you don't have a culture of safety, if you're not, if you're just playing lip service, you're going, you know, it's only a matter of time before something bad happens. So you want to make sure that you're doing everything you can to prevent that in advance. Along those lines, your reputation goes right into that, right? Up until recently, uh, Federal OSHA used to do these national press releases on people that they did citations against, right? Before they were even adjudicated. Um, so it's ironic, you know, we would get those uh, press releases just like you would, you know, they're put out on every major roofing publication. You see them all over the time. You know, um, Florida contractor gets, you know, $200,000 in citations. Ohio contractor gets this, that, whatever it is. Well, what they weren't saying is that there are defenses to those. And a lot of times those fines and citations are either reduced or thrown out. Um, and then under the Trump administration, towards the end of that era, they put out a memo saying they're not going to do that until it's been fully adjudicated. Now, whether that changes under the Biden administration, don't know. But that's something interesting to note. What's bad about that is if something like that gets out, okay, let's say, you know, um, when I was doing an investigation and it gets to the press and it gets out there, you don't know who's watching that news program, right? It could be your competitors, it could be your customer, it could be your potential customer, okay? And all it takes is two seconds, three seconds to ruin your reputation, right? You build it for a lifetime and that's all it takes to ruin it now. So uh, reputation management is absolutely key. And, you know, this is one of the things culture of safety will help prevent the sort of catastrophic, um, you know, uh, things happening to your reputation as a result of safety violations. Uh, I already mentioned insurance rates, but one other thing I want to say on that, it's not necessarily just your workers' comp premiums, okay? It could be your general liability, depending on the nature of the incident and what else happened on that job site. So if an injury results in damage to the job site or damage to another person's trade, you could potentially have G, you know, CGL triggered or other types of insurance triggered. So all of this is very important because um, you know, next to labor, insurance is probably one of your biggest costs, if not you know, the biggest cost. So uh, you wanna make sure that you're, you're watching out for it. Now, this is what you wanna pay attention to, okay? The key documentation. Remember, party with the best paper wins the day, right? I've already said that. So let's talk about each of these and I will tell you what to do and what not to do, okay? First is your safety manual. All of you have great safety manuals. I don't doubt that, right? They're probably beautiful. They're probably four color, spiral bound. They've probably been sitting on your shelf for a while. The problem is that I often see is they're not updated. So I just got telling you about how Washington, I, I guarantee you when we get off this webinar, uh, Washington's already added another safety rule, okay? It, that's, it's very aggressive when it comes to uh, creating legislation of all types, okay? So, and, uh, and administrative code. Um, you must update your safety manual. You know, I would recommend taking a look at it every six months, you know, because you are in one of the states that has a very active OSHA plan. Um, you also need to make sure that you are able to convey your safety manual in the language that your crew members speak. Okay, so I use Spanish here because that's the dominant one. But let's say you have a crew of, of I don't know, they, they speak French, okay? You better have a French safety manual. Okay, and, and the reason I say that is because if you can't convey your safety program to your workers in a language they understand, then you've got a problem, okay? Because a lot of times what we've seen inspectors do is one of the first questions they've asked is, did you get a safety manual? Yes, but it's only in English and I can't understand it. That doesn't help, right? So 
definitely Spanish. That's the dominant one that we see. If you've got Spanish speaking only crew members, you want to make sure that your safety materials are in Spanish. Okay. It's fairly easy to uh, get them translated now. Um, definitely recommend that you do that. Have sign off sheets. Okay. Again, it doesn't count unless you can show somebody got it. So you want to make sure that all your employees sign off on it. I recommend that you keep your safety manuals, a copy of each updated in each of your trucks. Okay. You keep it there for this reason. One of the things we're going to talk about is training your crew leader, training your superintendent. Okay, it's not the people that are on this call that end up with safety violations. It's the people out there in the field. And it's a lot of times because they don't know the process, right? So um, we've had certain instances, instances where inspectors will come out and they will say, okay, calculate the swing radius for me. And if you're like me, like I got to count on my fingers, I don't know, I can't figure that out. You know, you know, maybe in 10th grade when I was taking geometry or something, I could figure it out, but not now, okay? Um, so what, one of the things I like to do when I'm teaching superintendents or crew leaders, I say, look, if you end up getting a safety question that you don't understand, okay? First off, recognize that's a hypothetical. You shouldn't have to answer that anyway. But if you get something like that, Always say, well, I do one of two things when I don't know it. I keep my safety manual in the truck, and before I do something like that, I make sure to inspect it, right? Okay, and the second thing is, is I call the home office, and I talk to the safety director, or I talk to the boss, and I say, hey, what do you think about this? And they, they confirm what my analysis is, okay? And that's a great way to kind of punt the question, and, and it's, it should be the truth, right? That's why you want to have the safety manual available. And obviously, this is um, uh, with the idea that you have a physical safety manual. A lot of times, everything is digital now. So, you know, there are a lot of apps that allow you to pull it right up on your phone. So you can pull it up on your phone even better. Okay. And that's say, hey, what I do is I pull this up on my phone. Uh, this tells me how to do it. I run the numbers and then I call the home office to make sure I'm right before I get out there and do whatever I got to do. Okay. Um, the safety manual itself, okay, it's got to have everything that you do in it. And let me explain what that means, okay? So most of you just do roofing. I get that, right? Roofing Association, you do roofing. But you may also do siding, or you may do some residential work, or you may do plumbing or solar or whatever it might be, right? Well, your safety manual needs to encompass that additional work. So if you're doing structural work, you need to have um, specific safety policies and instruction on there as it relates to the type of work you're doing. So it's not just fall protection. It's not just how to tie up a ladder. It's not just how to hydrate. It's the PP that's associated with doing structural work. It's, you know, load bearing and how to deal with that, how to properly shore up stuff, you know, whatever it might be. Okay, you want to make sure that that is in your safety manual. As you start to grow and expand your company, you always want to think about, is this in my safety manual? Okay, now that I am selling windows, do I have window-related safety stuff in this manual? If I don't, guess what I need to put in there, okay? Um, the other thing I already mentioned, you know, as stuff updates, you definitely want it in there. Uh, even if it gets, you know, your safety manual is a lot like your bylaws. It's a pain to update. Um, the best thing that I recommend doing is if you do it every six months in the interim, if something comes out, you tackle it with toolbox talks and then you can add it in when you're done, okay? Um, safety enforcement. Okay, now this is, is the big one that everybody screws up. This is where contractors fail, okay? Uh, and I'll give you a great example of this, okay? Um, if you've got, uh, my grandfather, uh, let me just back up. I like to tell stories because I think they, they hit the point home, okay? My grandfather was a great man, a lot better than I am, right? Um, fought in the war, World War II, uh, was a roofer before he went into the war, okay? Uh, did residential work, and um, he uh, often would talk to me uh, about what life was like. I would ask him all kinds of questions. We would talk about, you know, what the war was like, what the depression was like, I've always been kind of a history nerd, and I wanted to talk to him about what times were like back then, right? So he would often tell me about when he was running jobs, you know, he had his favorite person. Uh, he had the guy that worked, that he knew from high school that would knock out jobs like it was nothing, okay? 
And then he would have to find other people to kind of supplement work. And he would get them here or there, or somebody would be a friend of a friend of a friend. Side note, I've never had anything good happen out of a friend of a friend, okay? I can't think of a single good instance that anything has ever happened out of that. So uh, he would bring these other people in and they wouldn't do that great of a job, okay? And I would talk to him, you know, he died probably 20 years ago. Um, but I would talk to him, I, I, was, I had just become a lawyer and I would talk to him about ocean, about safety and, you know, stuff like that. And I remember him telling me that, um, you know, he would have to really stay on the people that did not do a good job because they weren't safe. And I said, well, what about your favorite, your favorite guy out there? You know, what did he do? Did you guys, you know, I know you didn't tie off, you know, what did you, what was your safety? He's like, well, you know, it was a different time back then. We didn't, you know, we, we just kind of watched where we were going. You know, he wasn't the safest guy around, but I'm not going to tell him any different. Right. And I asked him, well, what'd you do with the other people? He said, well, I would go on the roof and I would try to tell, I would show them where the potential problems were, but yeah, we didn't tie off. We didn't do any of that kind of stuff. It didn't, you know, it was just, it was a dangerous job. Everybody knew that. And you just kind of watched yourself. So the reason I'm, you're probably saying, Trent, why are you blathering on about your grandfather? This is why, okay? Um, this is where contractors screw up. You must have a consistent disciplinary policy, okay? You must be able to show that you are disciplining everyone the same. So it doesn't matter whether it's your best producer or the person you just hired off a of work release, you've got to discipline them the same. So if you have a disciplinary program, that says, you know, uh, oral reprimand, written notice, um, you know, suspension termination, or based on gravity, you can accelerate. And you don't ever do that to your best producer because you don't want to lose them. Uh, that is going to destroy your unpreventable employee misconduct defense. That right there, you're done. Okay. And OSHA and WISHA knows to look for that. Okay. They, L and I go straight for that. They know how to fight it. They're trained on it. They look for it and you're done. Okay. So, the thing that gets you in trouble as an employer is disparate treatment. It doesn't matter whether you're talking about discrimination, harassment, uh, ADA issues, uh, vaccinations, uh, any of the stuff that we've been talking about. If you don't treat people the same, you get in trouble. Okay. So remember that. Uh, evidence of ongoing training, safety audits. Okay. One of the things I really recommend is doing job site safety audits before they get to the job. Okay. So you can do it in your home office or your crew leader, whoever can do it when they get out in the field. If you have defective equipment, if you got a frayed rope, throw it away. If you keep it in your truck, they will assume you're using it, okay? So get rid of it, eliminate it, get better equipment, you know, take that trip to Home Depot, do whatever you got to do to, to get short up before you get on that job. Um, you want to do random job site audits, okay? You don't want to tell people you're coming but if you go out there and you see something wrong, it gives you a chance to possibly correct it. And I get asked this question all the time. Trent, you're nuts. Why would I want to go out there and point out safety problems on my own jobs? Isn't gonna, isn't, you know, OSHA or Ellen I gonna use that against me? And the answer is no, if you correct it, right? So that just shows you've got a culture of safety. You want to be able to identify what the problems are, right? And if you go back and you do retraining and you have a great document that says, you know, retraining on fall protection and, you know, John, James, Fred, and Frank sign it, then guess what you just did, right? One, you create a great documentation, which I love. And two, you show a culture of safety because you're actively trying to find mistakes and fix them, okay? If you tell people you're coming, they're going to make it right. Right. So I always like to do anonymous uh, job sites, uh, checkups. Occasionally I do them, which is real fun. Um, third party consultants, a lot of great safety consultants out there. Um, definitely recommend that you use them. Again, it's like the example I gave. Nobody listens to me. But if I bring in somebody else that's saying the same exact thing that I say, all of a sudden my employees listen. Right. So same thing goes to you. I love them all. If you're listening, I love you guys. Don't don't hold it against me. Uh, but that's the idea behind it, right? You want to make sometimes, you know, if, if you have somebody else telling you you got a problem, you're going to listen to it. Uh, OSHA 10s and 30s. If I can get it, anybody can get it, okay? Very easy to get now. There's a lot of digital options for it. Um, really recommend that you get that. Again, it just, it gives your employees a sense of, of accomplishment. 
you know, it's something that they can have with them. And, and if you're investing in that, that's even better. Okay. Um, it also really helps during the defense of these types of complaints because it shows that your people are properly trained. It's, it's evidence of that. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about the inspection process itself. And I'm going to give you a link here in the next page, which has some great self-help stuff that I want you to take home. And that's, that's some homework for you. Okay. Everybody loves homework, right? Um, compliance officers. Okay. When they come out to the job site, they got to say who they are and why they're there. Okay. Um, on the federal side, a lot of times we hear, I'm a federal agent. Well, yeah, you are, but come on. Uh, but the key thing is, is that what you want to do is you want to find out why they are there. Okay. So if they say, Hey, I was just driving by and I saw, you know, four people on a roof without fall protection. What that does is it puts them in a box, right? That box is they are there for the purposes of seeing this, these four people that didn't have fall protection on. Does that give them, you know, carte blanche to walk through your, your building and look for, you know, electrical outlets and everything else. No, that's not why they're there. They're there for these people. Okay. There are exceptions to that. If there's a fatality, if there is some evidence that there is, you know, the potential for active injury, um, those things will get around that. But generally speaking, having those conversations at the beginning help frame the inspection. Okay. Recognize that on the walk around inspection, what they will do is they will get out there and they say, okay, I'd like to see this. I'd like to see that. They may want to go on the roof, whatever it is. At the end of the day, you want to be their shadow. Okay. And you want to have an SOP, a standard operating procedure that dictates what happens if an inspector gets out to your job site. Okay. So what does that look like? It looks like this. First off, again, always be compliant, always tell the truth. That's the third time I've said that. Okay. OSHA, if you're listening, I just said that three times. Okay. Um, so the other thing that, that you want to do is, is when they come out, is it a good idea to have your workers continue working? The answer to that is no, it's not a good idea, okay? I'll give you another real world example. In 2001, that kind of dates me. In 2001, I was representing a uh, underground utility contractor that had dug a trench on the side of a road. Uh, they were being site inspected for failure to have a trench box, okay? During the closing conference, uh, a crew member jumps into the, to the uh, ditch that was dug uh, grabs their lunchbox and then scampers out. Okay. That was another $5,000 citation. Um, you know, just not, it, it's just stupid. Right. So I had one assistant area director tell me, frankly, said, if you put me on a job site for long enough, anywhere in the United States, I will find a citation. Okay. So is it a good idea to have your workers continue working during an OSHA, uh, investigation? I don't think it is, okay? Uh, that being said, you don't want to sound the alarm. You're like, oh, OSHA's here, you know, everybody clear out. It's not that kind of thing. Um, next thing I want to tell you is when, that, when OSHA shows up to the job site, your superintendent, your project manager, whoever it is, they need to understand that they need to call the home office immediately, okay? And if you've got a safety director, they need to call them. And they need to say, hey, I've got OSHA here. Uh, you need to ask the inspector, hey, before we start, can you give me 20 minutes so I can get my manager out here, okay? Oftentimes they will do that. They will, unless there's immediate harm, they will work with you, okay? And I would much rather have somebody out there that's calm, cool, and collected rather than somebody who's who believes that their job may be at stake for safety violations, right? So um, that is a good way to kind of control the situation. On the walk around inspection, you want to shadow whatever they're doing. You know, if they are taking photos, you want photos. You want current job site conditions. The worst thing that happens is I ask for, okay, show me the job site. And, you know, I get the satellite imagery, the Eagle View, whatever, after the fact. I'm like, this doesn't help me. I don't need this. I need what the job site looked like then, because there may be factual defenses that I can assert based on the in-progress construction, okay? My job is to get creative, right? I, I've got to look at everything and figure out what do we have here, if I don't have what the job site looked like at the time, it's not going to help anything. So you need to do the same thing, okay? Now, here's the next part, and this is where it gets a little bit tricky. Witness statements, okay? A lot of times what the investigator will do is they will ask for a witness statement, okay? Normally, employees, unless they request their own representative, have the ability to talk to, um, you know, a wish investigator uh, privately, confidentially, they can do that, okay? 
Um, that means that your council can't be present. You can't be present. They can request their own representative, but that's how it works. Now, if it is a supervisory employee, if it is an officer or a director, you have the ability to have council and uh, management rep there. Okay, and that makes a lot of difference. So your supervisor needs to understand that they have the ability to request that. And before they actively engage in an interview, they should request it because normally there's a big difference between what happens when council is present and when they're not, or when a member of management is present and when they're not. Okay, it can make a big difference. And I'll give you, here's a real world example. This is actually, this is a great example. You're gonna love this one. Okay, I'm gonna pat myself on the back later. Um, we had a situation, I'm representing a roofing contractor, and um, OSHA wanted to do some follow-up uh, interviews, okay? They had requested the superintendent and a handful of crew, of, uh, crew people, okay? And um, they wanted to do it at the job site. I said, no, that's like inviting a cop out to a meth lab. Let's move it to our office. So we moved it to our office, okay? OSHA shows up. I've got management there. Uh, the OSHA investigator starts asking the superintendent a question. The superintendent is Mexican. The OSHA uh, investigator speaks Spanish, but is from Puerto Rico. Okay, And they are talking about the installation of a tile roof. Now, I know enough Spanish to be dangerous. I was a minor in college. I, you know, I know all, my, all the curse words. That's, I'm, I'm good enough to understand it. The management, uh, the member of management was also fluent in it. So we're both sitting there listening to what the superintendent is saying. And what was interesting is we both caught the fact that the investigator misinterpreted one of the terms of art that was used to describe tile, okay? And had I not jumped in and management jumped in, that could have affected their case real, in a very, very bad way. So one of the things I like to insist is if they're gonna interview employees, I want to make sure that we've got a competent translator there, okay? Because dialects different, differ all over the place. We've seen that, you know, it, it is something that is, is very significant. So during this time, I had, the, I had the opportunity to be present and so did a member of management. And prior to this, we had the opportunity to talk to the witness, you know, figure out, you know, refresh on, on certain safety training. And it takes away a lot of the anxiety, right? And that's the key thing here is everybody gets really anxious about any kind of government investigation. I don't, I don't blame you. You know, it's nobody likes the government, right? It, it scares them. So um, I'm going to give you another personal story, okay? Because I think if you don't pay attention to anything, maybe you'll pay attention to my own embarrassing stories. This was my first vehicle, okay? This was a 1981 Ford F-150. As you can see, it was a piece of crap. Uh, I believe I paid... 450 bucks for it, and I probably paid about 250 bucks too much. Um, it had the old crappy vinyl seats, not the nice ones we've got now, uh, that I had to duct tape, and it was it was a beater. Okay, but it got the job done. So my father was a very patient man. Um, you know, grew up on a farm. Uh, you know, beat into me the value of hard work, literally, um, and he decided that he would teach me how to drive one day. So we go out to a field similar to this one and uh, he started teaching me how to drive. We did the three point turns and the parallel parking and all that great stuff, right? And at the end of it, what he said, he said, son, what I wanna do now, and he always referred to me as son or boy. It was never by, by name, it was son or boy. So son, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna pretend I'm an officer and I'm gonna pull you over and I wanna see how you react. Okay. Now, the reason he did this was because he knew I was a punk ass kid and he knew at the end of the day what was going to happen is he didn't want me to do something stupid, right? He didn't want a cop to pull me over and for me to do something dumb. So he wanted me to understand the process. So he pretends, he pretends to pull me over. I show my license, my registration, all that kind of stuff, insurance, and I go about my merry way. Well, sure enough, six months later, uh, I ended up getting a speeding ticket and he beat my you know what, you know, but. I didn't make it, didn't do anything stupid, right? I knew how to respond. I, you know, I was very calm, cool, and collected, and it took away a lot of my anxiety. Now, what's the point to this embarrassing story? The point is, is if you do the same thing with your crew, with then it understand what the process is. I'm not talking about strong arming them. 
you don't ever want to tell a crew, don't talk to OSHA. Okay. You can't do that. Do not do that. They, they must fully cooperate. They must fully tell the truth fourth time. Okay. But what I do want to do is I want to hit home the fact that if you talk about what happens during an investigation, then that really helps them understand the process, right? It takes away that anxiety. And that's the difference because people say dumb things when they're not thinking straight. Okay. I see it. I, if I had, if I had every single time that a crew member has said they haven't got a training, when I'm looking at the fact that they got training, I could retire right now. If I had a dollar for every time that's happened. Okay. So I want to talk a little bit about uh, the citation action steps. And then when with that, we're almost at the top of the hour. You will uh, either receive a uh, citation or a complaint. Uh, and, and oftentimes it's called citation and notice of assessment. Um, there's a lot of things that I recommend if you get that. <coughs> First is, is make sure you verify your contest time period. You've got 15 days from the date of receipt <coughs> to appeal it. You want to confirm that with the investigator and get that in writing. What I like to do is I, I confirm it with email. I say, this is a confirm, this is my deadline to, to contest this, to appeal this. If this is not correct, please let me know immediately, okay? That's important because a lot of times when you believe you got it is not when they say they got it. So that's something that you want to do, okay? The other thing that you want to do is recognize that if you do uh, go through the appeal process, that LNI does have the ability to maintain jurisdiction and try to resolve it through what's commonly referred to as an informal conference, okay? An informal conference is not confidential, but it does give you the opportunity to resolve things. So I'm a big believer in going through this process because a lot of times what you're trying to do is mitigate the damage, okay? You're trying to assess what you've got in front of you. You don't always want to take stuff to the Supreme Court, right? You don't want to fight things tooth and nail, and it may be something that you can resolve out, okay? If that's not the case, you can certainly appeal it, and a lot of times it's in front of the Board of Industrial Insurance Appeals. So what I've done is I've given you a link here. This is a great link. It's a great um, tool guide that LNI's put out. Uh, I like it a lot. I think it really gives you sort of a understanding of, of what your rights are. I kind of went into a little bit more detail, especially from a, a lawyer side of things, but I do recommend that you take a look at it. Last thing I mentioned is unpermittable employee misconduct. Okay. You probably said to yourself, Trent, why are you talking about all these documents? Okay. I don't understand. This is why. Okay. It's the most used defense to any type of safety related violation. Okay. You've got to show, and this is straight from, from Washington case law, a thorough safety program, including work rules, training, and equipment. We talked about that safety manual, okay, ongoing updates, making sure you got it in English and Spanish, adequate communication of these rules to employees. We talked about that, toolbox talks, all those types of things. Steps to discover and correct violations of its safety rules, safety audits, okay, infective enforcement. Remember, don't do disparate treatment. Have everything be consistent. If you do these four things, it puts you in a good position to have an unpreventable employee misconduct defense. Is it a slam dunk? No, but it does give you something to fight with. And oftentimes that's all you're looking for, okay? So if you remember that, that is the key thing. There's a lot of other defenses available, but this is the one that I wanted you to focus on. Now, what I'm gonna do is turn it back over to Tracy. And I knew I just threw a whole lot at you. So I wanna see if you guys have any questions for me. I do not see any more questions. It's not going to let me start the video, my video again. So I guess I won't be popping back up. But I wanted to thank you. That was incredible information, and so appreciative. Um, you know, we've got such a great um, association here, and it's just so wonderful to have all this information for our members. Um, this recording will appear um, on our YouTube channel in a couple weeks. But um, in the meantime, if you, any of our members have any um, questions, you can definitely reach out to Trent or you can reach out to me and I can get that through. Um, if, can we get a copy of the PowerPoint that you did? Sure. That would yeah. be perfect. Absolutely. And we'll put that in the Members Clubhouse section of our website. And um, I just want to also say that in the Members Clubhouse, we have a ton of the checklist, the job site protection plans, um, 
all of those things already written that any of our members can download and use as well. So with that said, let everybody get back to work. And I want to thank you again, Trent. It was so good to see you and thank you for being here. Thank you, Tracy. It was my pleasure. You guys stay safe. Talk to you soon. Bye-bye. See ya.